Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. You know, it's fascinating with all this, uh, you know, back and forth uh, politically in the UK, in France, uh, in the United States. Um, it seems like politics changes every minute. You don't know who's going to win. Um, and uh, there does seem to be, at least in some places, a movement toward competency and to the center. And so I wanted to check in with Dominic Carty, who, uh, you know, about a year ago launched something called uh, Centerized Conservatives that then got rebranded as Centerized Canadians and have been talking about the need for a party of the center in Canada. And I understand that you might have some news for us. Dominic Carty, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on again. It's good to chat. Yeah, so we just heard today after many, many months after submitting our, our paperwork in February, the first day of February, finally got noticed today that by the end of this week, we should get the signature from the chief electoral officer, which means that we're then uh, the second to last step away from being a full-fledged party like the Liberals, Conservatives, NDP, and others. So with that, we our last step is that we have to get a candidate on the ballot, and we've got a fantastic candidate lined up for the Montreal by-election that the prime minister has to call by July 28th. And as soon as we get uh, that candidate on the ballot, then the Canadian Future Party becomes Canada's newest official political party. And the name has changed again. What's the, the current name? Uh, the name's always been for the new party, the, the Canadian Future Party. The Canadian Future the Party. Travenir Canadien. Not Travenir Canadien. Yeah. So as you mentioned at the beginning, it was actually Rick Peterson, who was a, a Tory leadership candidate back a few years ago, who started Centre Ice Canadians. And I joined with him in that effort. And then last September... We just had a discussion with the leadership in that group saying, what's what are we doing here? That is this worth continuing as sort of as a nonprofit outside of politics effort to try and just change the political dialogue? And we saw what was happening with both the liberals and the conservatives and said, no, we've got to get some other option on the table that there's this huge void, just like you said in your introduction uh, in our politics, that where we just are missing a voice bluntly of grownups. Where can we talk about evidence? Where can we talk about making democracy deliver and getting results for Canadians for the taxes they pay? Having a, a defense and foreign policy uh, that is something we can be proud of rather than something we have to be deeply embarrassed about whenever our prime minister, no matter which party they're from, goes on the world stage. So there's a lot of uh, multiple crises hitting our country all at the same time. And the folks around uh, the table who came, came up with this new party, we all agreed that, look, whether you've got a background in Liberal, Tory, NDP, Green Party, doesn't matter. We need a party that's going to be a small L Liberal Party to fight for limited government, government doing what it can do best, giving power to the private sector to make the money that we need to fund strong social programs, and letting it set, setting aside the pointless culture wars that's infected our politics from the states that is just taking up more and more time around more and more foolishness. Let people live the way they want, sleep with, love who they want. That is not the business of the government. And I don't want to talk about it. I want to talk about why Canadians don't have anywhere to live, why we don't have a, uh, a, a defense policy that uh, is even vaguely credible, why we have both the Liberal and parties, Tory parties on that subject, both saying that, yeah, Tories now apparently aren't even going to try and reach 2% under Mr. Paliev, and the Liberals say they might do it in maybe a, a 10, 10 or 12 years or so when maybe they might buy some submarines. We've got to grow up. And I think there's, again, a huge void in the center of our politics, and I'm hoping the Canadian Future Party can help fill that void. Fantastic. Sounds exciting. Now, um, you've got a very relevant history in politics. So let's take a step back so everyone understands where you come from. You were a cabinet minister in the New Brunswick government, correct? Correct. I was education and early childhood development uh, minister in the government of Premier Higgs from 2018 to 22 when I stepped down. And why'd you step down? Point of principle, really. I've got a, a, a big problem with politicians who say one thing in opposition and then do the opposite. Not because new information comes to light, because I think that's we need more of that, more honesty with voters about how things can change. But there was an effort to really impose an ideological agenda that uh, took the progressive conservative party further and further to the socially conservative right to the point that in the election that's going to be coming up here in my province in a couple of months time there's now going to be a candidate for the progressive conservative party who literally has claimed publicly that she can raise the dead someone from an extreme uh, right-wing religious background and to my mind this is the sort of nonsense that we need to be fighting against rather than encouraging to come into our politics we we see far too much of that uh, 
across Canada and the states and elsewhere these days. We need to get back to, again, having an evidence-based politics. So where do you think the position is for the Canadian Future Party? We like to say it's not left, not right, but forward. That we talk about the left and the right as though there's these sort of facts of life, almost like the laws of physics. They're not. The idea of left and right came up over the last couple of hundred years when some countries in a pretty small number were trying to figure out how to make democracy work. And you had folks on one side who thought that the government could do everything and the other side, government shouldn't do anything. And those two sides fought it out for a couple of hundred years. We know the answer. We can see it all around us in the world. You can see it in the European democracies, in North America, Taiwan, Australia, Japan, some other places where the rule of law, a limited government, a free market working to power that power an economy that gives you enough left over that you could run efficient government programs, anti-corruption initiatives, the rule of law. These are things that are part of a package that puts the left-right dynamic to bed. We know that having the government run nothing is a recipe for disaster. And we've seen that. I've had the chance to live in some pretty sketchy places around the world. You don't want to have a country that has no government. And this libertarian fantasy that you can just tell everyone to just yeah, look after themselves and somehow the things will all work out. I encourage folks to go and visit Somalia and see how that's working out for them. You end up in a situation like that and countries like that where you just have the rule of the strongest. And of course, that's why some of the folks who like to talk about freedom the most are the ones who are actually most opposed to it, most interested in just gathering power to themselves. And then on the left, you'd think that after 100 plus years now of experiments with communism and more radical forms of left-wing socialism, that that would also be obviously a failed disaster because humans are inherently competitive. Humans create markets even if you lock five people in a jail cell for half a day. People will start trading cigarettes or buttons or whatever else. Humans like to trade. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's no equivalent between saying that just because humans are instinctively a trading species, that somehow that means we inevitably have to fall into a trap of just stealing and grabbing and selfishness that uh, some on the left would like to have us believe. We've shown in Canada that you can build that mixed system where you've got a strong public sector powered by a strong private sector, and that those two spheres re respect each other and build and grow off each other. Because you need a rule of law, you need good regulations, not too many, but enough to make sure that you can have an economy that thrives, that can create a, a, an appropriate and appealing a place for a country for people to want to invest their money. So these things are all work together in a virtuous cycle, but we've got a, a politics, a political system now, political parties now that want to claim that somehow you've got to pick one side or the other. And if you say that something's good on the other side, that you're evil, it's utter nonsense. The only people benefiting from this left-right foolishness are the left and right-wing political parties who want to make you believe that there's no other choice. It's just not true. I've got a weird political background. I spent years in the NDP. Spent years working for the American uh, American uh, government-funded organization in developing countries in Asia and Africa. Then I had my experience as a progressive conservative cabinet minister. All of those things showed me that humans are kind of the same everywhere in the world, and people respond to incentives, and that the best forms of government are limited and help to support a strong private sector while strongly supporting and protecting individual rights. And the only countries that protect individual rights to any high degree are the ones that have that sort of mixed system that Canada has. So I hear people on the left and right saying Canada is broken or Canada has to apologize for this and that. Rubbish. We need to start being proud of ourselves, proud of the fact that we are a country that introduced new ideas around human rights to a world that had never heard of them before, while at the same time giving most of our population access to levels of wealth that would have been unimaginable for kings 150 years ago. The sort of life that you and I are living, climate-controlled houses, being able to buy any our choice of food from around the world at the grocery stores, even as those prices go up, and we absolutely have to deal with that. But we've got to stop thinking that we're living in some sort of desperate hellscape. We live in the best country in the history of this planet. We've got to start talking about that, not in a jingoistic way of saying that everyone else sucks, but saying that we have got a solid foundation here on which to build something even better. And we're not going to do that by either saying we're terrible or by saying that our history is something that we have to uh, apologize for in full. We've got to recognize that everyone, every human, 
every society makes mistakes. It's how you fix them that matters. And Canada has got an incredibly impressive record of fixing problems. And we need to get back to that because that's what people I find are frustrated about today is that politicians and our political elite have stopped trying to fix problems. And they've simply fallen back to blaming folks on the other side. Then we wait a few years and then they switch again and we hear the same rhetoric from the other side and it goes on and on. When was the last time we had a government in this country that really fixed the problems Canadians cared about? I think the answer to that question is kind of obvious. And that's a, a gap in our system that the Canadian Future Party is hoping to fill. And we've got former Tory cabinet ministers like Peter Kent, former NDP members of parliament like Denis Blanchette. We've got liberal and green organizers. We've got people from across the country who've all been inside our political parties and know that multi-party, small L liberal democracy is the way to go. They just don't have a political home. So we're building a house. So we're starting in that, trying to show that uh, we can solve our problems right from the beginning by building a party that's going to reflect our, our values and I hope give Canadians an appealing option in the next election. So, Dominic, in the last uh, conservative leadership campaign, my sense is that Jean Charest was running sort of uh, in in your your lane, um, and yet the Conservative Party voted in favor of Pierre Polyev, who you know I, I think is to the right of that, um, and uh, and he's leading by a mile in the polls right now. So you know I'd like to believe what you're saying is true, but don't the polls suggest otherwise? Uh, no, far from it. Uh, Mr. Charest, first off, I was happy to support him as uh, as the choice uh, between he and Mr. Polyev. Uh, the last time I was a, a member of the Federal Conservative Party, very briefly, just to vote for Mr. Charest. Mr. Charest ran a very mainstream, old school campaign. Mr. Charest is closer ties to China than I would view as acceptable. The Canadian Future Party is going to talk about decoupling from China and other dictatorships as we need to build a, an alliance of democracies, something that lots of people from across the political spectrum and other democracies are talking about. We're talking about radical solutions to some of our governmental problems. When I talked earlier, I mentioned about making democracy deliver. I didn't see much of that in Mr. Charest's platform. And I think that's part of the reason why it was so easy for Mr. Polyevre to win so handily, is that the establishment, whether it's in the Liberal Party, the Tories, the NDP even, has become so stale. Their ideas have become so old their solutions so clearly disconnected from today's realities that they open the door to the populist extremists on the left and the right who are now dominating our politics. So what I'm saying is that there's this broad group of people in the middle, including a lot of people who are involved in politics, who know exactly what's wrong. But our current party system isn't allowing those ideas to be expressed because our current party leaders benefit from the idea that if you go over to the right, then you're some sort of fascist. And if you go over to the left, you're some sort of communist. And that reflects the sort of nonsense debates that you see online and social media, which unfortunately is more and more where our politics is happening, from liberal and conservative activists. And we're saying, look, there are great ideas the Liberal Party has brought to the table that has made Canada a better country. And there are equally great ideas that the Conservative Party, in its different incarnations, have brought to Canada to make this a better country. We gain nothing from disparaging and denigrating and insulting each other based on who our parents voted for. What matters to me in 2024 is what options are our Canadian political parties going to put on the table to defend our Arctic and our sovereignty, to help prepare to meet our alliance commitments to join with our NATO partners to defend the free world against the rising threat of authoritarian dictatorships in Russia, China, Iran, North Korea? What are we going to do to make sure our healthcare system can actually deliver? Because when I go and talk to high school and university classes and ask those kids, are you comfortable paying 40 odd percent of your salary in taxes so that you can receive healthcare? And the answer I get back nearly universally now is no, because they don't feel they can access that service. Why would anyone want to pay for something they can't get? So we've got a problem of democratic delivery across so many files. We've got a problem of incompetence when it comes to uh, the incredible damage that the Trudeau liberals have done to our immigration system over the last few years with the uncontrolled uh, dismantling of our temporary foreign worker and student programs that have led to a crisis that has done more to damage Canadians' acceptance of immigration than the most right-wing bigot could ever have uh, dreamed of. So there are serious challenges to these various problems that I am 100% confident, sadly, 
that we're going to go into the next election with the liberals and conservatives offering nothing more than warmed up, overbaked, old school sound bites around how one side's going to spend much, much more money that we don't have. The other side's going to claim that, oh, the Tories, they're evil. They don't want to destroy Canada. They're like Mr. Trump. We've got to get over this. We've got to start talking about solutions. So when it comes to healthcare, let's start talking about the fact that the reality is in Canada, is that our healthcare system is already semi-private. Our doctors in most provinces are not public servants. They're small business people, medium business people in some cases. How can we make the argument that it's fine to have the nationalized healthcare system we have right now operating with doctors operating as private business people, but it's not okay for a knee replacement clinic or a hip replacement clinic to operate under the same terms? We've got to start having these conversations that really take on some of the sacred cows that we've had in politics in Canada for a long time. Talk about supply management. I've already mentioned defense and the fact that we need to deal with procurement issues. We've got decades of broken promises to First Nations that have involved vast expenditures and little in the way of results. We have got to start talking about results and delivery. And that means clear plans, it means timelines, and it means budgets. And that's what you're going to see from us, because what I want to see the Canadian Future Party do is in addition to winning what I hope will be a good number of seats in an election, I want to see us put these ideas back on the table so that the liberals and conservatives, and they're often kind of the uh, pliant supporters in the media on both sides, don't have the excuse to say, oh, there's no one putting anything serious about Canada's national defense on the table. So it's fine that we just have Mr. Polyevra saying he's going to appease his MAGA base by refusing to meet a 2% of GDP commitment for Canada, something that you know, all of our NATO allies have committed to, something now even Mr. Trudeau has sort of committed to, although I have doubts whether or not this is going to be anything more than 2035 or something like many, that. Uh, yeah, it's just, it's years and years out. And Again, in terms of this being government by press release, when the defense paper came out a couple of months back, there was no mention of the submarines that are now magically going to take us to 2% in an unspecified number of years. We don't know where we're going to buy the subs from. We don't have any of those details. So it is a sad thing when we have our defense policy being driven by Mr. Trudeau, who responded to pressure from our NATO allies, and in desperation at the NATO summit last week, just came up with this new submarine idea. I don't necessarily think it's wrong. I just doubt that it's a policy. I just think it's a press release. And Mr. Polyevre, who from his side, is abandoning the idea of defending democracy by saying he can't commit to going to 2% of our GDP because our fiscal situation is so bad. I got news from Mr. Polyevre. Democracy isn't free. The old George W. Bush line, which, good Lord, I never thought as a, when I was a young NDP or that I would ever be quoting George W. Bush approvingly, but freedom isn't free. The Ukrainians are bleeding and dying for us right now. We might want to notice that we have a massive, functionally undefended border across our Arctic. And we might want to notice that the Americans, who we are relying on for our defense, are increasingly irritated at the free ride that they're having to offer us. And we might want to think about what a Trump Vance government in the US might do in terms of undermining security for the North American continent. And essentially saying, as Mr. Vance has clearly said in relation to our enemies overseas, who I believe, unfortunately, he sides with, that uh, he doesn't really care about Ukraine. He doesn't really care about other countries. He's interested in America first. We can never say we weren't warned about these things. And one of the, my biggest frustrations is that Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Polyevre have been fundamentally dishonest with Canadians by not being clear with us about the multiple threats that our country is facing and the fact that is, of course, linked to why they're not talking about it, that they've got absolutely nothing in the way of new solutions to fix these problems. Instead, we're going to hear an election based on culture war, rage farming, with one side going after the other about various issues that aren't on even on our election agenda, but will largely be copied from the United States. I'm tired of US-style politics. I want a Canadian politics, Canadian solutions, and to make Canadian democracy deliver. We're chatting with Dominic Cardi about a new party, the Canadian Future Party, that uh, he's planning on launching. He just got uh, approval from Elections Canada today. We're going to take a break and come back in two minutes with Dominic and talk a little bit about both the politics 
uh, and the policy of uh, of his proposal, and maybe uh, also some of the personalities. Stay with us, everybody. Back in two minutes. Interesting conversation about sort of the hole in the middle of the Canadian political spectrum uh, in the center. And is Dominic right that there's an opportunity for a brand new political party? Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Dominic Carty. He's a former cabinet minister in the New Brunswick uh, government. He was minister of uh, education. Um, and uh, I'd spoken with a couple of times about uh, an organization called uh, Centerized Conservatives, Centerized Canadians, and this sort of need for someone in the political spectrum to represent the center. Uh, Dominic, I want to ask you, you know, I, I think of myself and a lot of people I talk to in business as a fiscal conservative and a social progressive. Um, and uh, and a lot of people will comment that they feel, you know, left the parties have left them, that the Liberal Party has moved far, too far to the left, the Conservative Party has moved too, too far to the right. Um, and uh, in business, a lot of people, you know, as you say, don't think we have, as Pierre Trudeau said, uh, any business in the bedrooms of the nation. Uh, and so therefore very supportive of some social progressive uh, issues, um, gay rights, uh, gay marriage, uh, you know, abortion rights, et cetera. But at the same time, um, believe in limited government and uh, more fiscal sustainability um, and more of a prosperity uh, productivity agenda than we may have uh, currently. That said, we feel like politics have gone a different way. Um, and you, know, you take a look at uh, you know, the Conservative Party. Some people think that the Conservative Party has been taken over by the, the trucker convoy and, uh, and the PCP. Uh, uh, and uh, not PCP, uh, PPC, what, what's the, the Maxine Bernier Party, I apologize. Um, but people- I feel like I'm on PCP when I read the, uh, the People's Party's uh, platform. So fair, fair, fair enough uh, to slip at the tongue there. Sorry, I apologize. Um, and 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 some uh, you know fairly right wing um, points of view, as you say, uh, you know socially uh, uh, right wing uh, attitudes, socially conservative attitudes. And then you know the Liberal Party to stay in power has clearly had to enter into this supply and confidence agreement with the NDP that's taken the Liberal Party uh, to the to the left. Um, uh, how far and how much um, because of the NDP agreement, or they would have done on their own. Um, is uh, is a matter of uh, discussion. And it's left this hole. But it would appear that the Republican Party in the United States has moved significantly to the right. Uh, in the most recent election in uh, in the UK, you know, the Reform Party, um, which is a brand new right-wing party, got almost as many votes as the old Conservative Party and and split the vote on the right, um, allowing the, the Labour Party to take over. Uh, in France, uh, Maria Le Pen's uh, right-wing party has uh, had precedence. In Italy, uh, a right-wing party has taken over. In, in Hungary, a right-wing party has taken over. Is there really an opportunity for the centre? Like, if anything, I was looking, when we first started talking a couple of years ago, at Macron in France as the best example of a brand new party in the center of being successful. And look what's happened to him and his party. They've gone down to, uh, to defeat. So have people moved to the extremes or do you really believe absolutely. people are still in the center? Well, the, the parties have moved to the extremes, and if the only options on the table are the parties that are already existing, then you've got no choice. And that's why you end up with you know, people like you and me end up being in that position as social liberals, fiscal conservatives of having no home. I don't want anything to do with this American culture war nonsense of going on about you know, when women have their periods and crossing their travel across state lines to prevent them from getting abortions. It's disgusting. I don't care about who people sleep with or love. We have a legal system that should protect people's rights. And we shouldn't need to talk about it the rest of the time. We should just make sure it's defended there as part of our legal system, not our politics on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's an accusation that I'd level against the extremists of the left and the right, because both sides love to get into these sort of culture war, war battles, because that's a lot easier to talk about than it is to talk about, as you were saying earlier, how do we fix our productivity gap? So you look at some of those other examples. Uh, I take it, I put a slightly different spin on a couple of them. The I know some folks, including a couple of our friends who actually got elected as Labour MPs last week. The Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn, the leader before the new Prime Minister, Keir Starmer, was a seriously hardcore left-wing extremist who ended up by turning the Labour Party into a vehicle for anti-Semitism and you know, bizarre and totally failed economic ideas. Fortunately, the good thing with uh, the disorganized left is they usually don't win elections, so he never won an election. Keir Starmer brought the party back to 
a problem solving approach, not being dogmatic, not being crazy left wing in that traditional sense, but talking about new ideas. And yes, they're absolutely the reform party came up and uh, certainly got a chunk of the vote in five seats. But the Labour Party won one of the largest majorities in British history. Mr. Macron uh, won election and re-election on the sort of platform we're talking about. And despite that move to the extremes and what looked like a sure win for the extreme right-wing uh, party led by Ms. Le Pen in France, pushed them back into third place in the final round of the recent uh, legislative elections. So, But I the, only the, way, there... the only way, I apologize for interrupting, let's talk about some of these. The only way that... <laughs> He was able to do that was by having a strategic agreement between uh, his party and and uh, the left, uh, such that they wouldn't split the vote. And uh, and and you know they ended up uh, um, succeeding uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and and not splitting the vote uh, in uh, in the in the British election in the UK election. My understanding is that the Labour vote only went up by a small amount in absolute terms. What ended up happening is the conservative vote got split between the conservative uh, and the reform. And so splits work negatively uh, and uh, and unification or strategic voting. And, and you know, that one of the nice things about having a two stage uh, uh, ballot process in France is you get to think yeah. about, uh, you know, who the leading candidates are such that you can actually have sort of what uh, uh, so many people in Canada always talk about strategic voting. It's it's it, they they did it by definition. So aren't you going to by definition fragment the political system even more? No, because I don't see unless uh, unless you've heard of anyone else saying otherwise. Tell me the party that's talking about the need to go to two percent spending on defense within a couple of years and then a ten year plan to get to three percent or up. Our NATO partners are going far beyond. Poland's going to be up at five percent. Tell me the party that's going to make that pledge that we are not going to touch social issues, that we are going to stop talking about those issues, that we are going to defend rights and focus on their enforcement. And that that means as well, a focus on enforcement from the police side across the country so the Canadians can live without the fear that's come from in recent years from uh, police forces that increasingly don't enforce the law because there isn't the political will to support them. Tell me which party is going to talk about seriously reforming the Canada Health Act so we can deal with the real reasons why we have such a shortage of doctors in this country, which is protectionism around credential recognition, which is around the misuse of hospitals as uh, and restrictions on the access to operating theaters. These are issues that no one else is talking about that could actually fix these problems. On the left, they're going to talk about how we should spend more money, as though that magically fixes problems. Of course, you need money to fix problems, but the idea that spending on its own gives you good results is just not true. But they can get away with that sort of nonsense argument because on the right, you'll have people who'll say, well, we're just going to cut costs and that's going to somehow make things better. So as long as we continue to have this fact-free discussion with between these two extremes, nothing much is going to get better. So I am making no apologies at all for putting a new political party on the table in Canada in 2024. As you said a couple of times through this discussion, there's no one else talking about these problems. And if those ideas that the Canadian Future Party wants to put forward in the election, strong defense, discussion around Canadian values, being proud of them, recognizing that pride comes in part from our ability to solve problems as we've demonstrated since Confederation, healthcare reform, dealing with the affordability crisis, a radical plan around immigration. These are things we're going to be fleshing out in the next few weeks as we get ready for the Montreal by-election. That's going to be our first electoral contest. We're going to be talking about things no one else is talking about. The Are other you, parties think that we're picking up ground. Maybe they'll start talking about those ideas. That's democracy. That'd be just great. Our ideas are open to be stolen by anyone at all. It's the way things Are you going to be able to society. nominate enough candidates? Uh, are you going to get invited to uh, participate in the debates? Are you going to get enough media? As I found recently, if you don't get the media attention, if you don't get invited to debates, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy that uh, you're not considered uh, relevant. Oh, for sure. And they're absolutely huge. Uh, you sort of mentioned you know, how our system is biased in favor of the existing parties. I am under no illusions about the incredible obstacle ahead of myself as leader and my party as soon as it's registered. Because just to correct you on something, we, we are expecting to hear this week on the final approval uh, rather than having heard yet. We just heard they're going to let us know by Friday. But make no apologies for it because, again, there's no one talking about these ideas. And to my mind, a Liberal Party elected that continues with the endless series of announcements without any real follow through that we've seen from Mr. Trudeau 
or the weird American rage farming that Mr. Polyevra is engaging in because it generates online clicks. They're welcome to continue that sort of politics. There are more and more Canadians I hear from who are just fed up with it and want to see something different and better as well. Because it's not just about being new, it's about having serious plans. And that's why I'm really proud that we've got people with legislative, including cabinet level experience, sitting around the table already helping to make sure that we're well prepared for the campaign. We're going to do our best to nominate as many candidates as possible, something that uh, will also make us a bit different. If there's any writing in the country where there are already incumbent MPs who are clearly doing exactly the sort of thing we talk about, we have no issue not running a candidate against them. It's not about party. It's about the country. And you're going to see that focus, that my dream for this party would be that we were able to win power at some point in the not distant future, hold it for enough time to be able to change our institutions, and then we can go back to the more normal politics we're used to. But we need a radical change right now because things aren't working. Not that they're broken, but they're not working. And so we got to fix them, not knock them down. So if I had to sort of guess as to where your target market is, it would be suburbia. Um, I, I think that uh, the, the rural uh, communities are going to be too conservative for you to dominate and uh, be successful and, and urban, maybe too, uh, new, too NDP or liberal oriented. But uh, suburbia might be attracted by your policies. Uh, is that a, a correct uh, sense of target positioning? Uh, we, we did a poll recently, just uh, which we tried to do a few sort of surveys every now and again, just to give a sense of where we are with, with public support uh, and just even awareness of the party. And we do well in Atlantic Canada, which is probably not surprising because I'm heading up this project and I'm somewhat well known in, in the region. And otherwise, we absolutely do well in some of those communities you talk about. But there are surprising pockets, uh, for example, Alberta, which I think is probably because of Albertans having seen the consequence of having a left and a right wing government of going, my God, can't we have someone who's at least able to you know, sit down and talk with folks from both sides? So I think that uh, there is appeal across the country for an idea like this. You've got about one in two Canadians who say they're ready to vote for a centrist party who identify as being broadly in the middle. We've talked again about how that's slightly a yeah, sort of an illusory term because you know what's the middle for you might be slightly different for me and for someone else. But Around this idea, evidence-based, strong on defense, problem and so, uh, solution oriented, and having good plans and the right team of people to put them in place. I just don't see the other guys talking about it. We're also talking just because it does tie into that. I mentioned a change in culture that in addition to the change in the way we talk about our politics during election campaigns, we also need to some, see some changes in the way the parties themselves operate. And my decade or so of experience working internationally dozens of political parties from around the world, I hope will put me in good stead to be able to come up with some ideas there. And one of them you see is in our constitution, that the leader of the Canadian Future Party, if elected as a uh, into, into office, would only serve for 10 years and then uh, afterwards step down, which I think is one of the things that we have seen at the moment is Term limit. Mr. Trudeau is suffering from having been in power a little bit too long. And we've seen other leaders who've fallen into that trap. So let's fix those things. Canada, well, I do think this that, is our country. Uh, let's fix those I solutions. I do think some uh, some proposals uh, from a from a democracy standpoint, from a governance standpoint, might have some uh, some uh, attraction too. Uh, but one of the things I really want to talk to you about, which I think you've touched on, but I think is really critical, particularly in the last UK election, is competency. Let's take a break uh, for some messages and come back and chat a little bit about competency in government with Dominic Cardi, uh, who's launching a new party, the Canadian Future Party. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Dominic Carty. He's uh, the leader of and launching a new political party in Canada called the Canadian Future Party that's going to be in the center. Uh, my sense is socially progressive, fiscally conservative. Um, and Dominic, I want to ask you a question. I've interviewed two people last week about the UK election, and both of them uh, were saying that it wasn't an ideological election. It was a competency issue, that the Conservative Party with, I think it was five leaders in five years, or five prime ministers in five years, um, uh, and, and Liz Truss, uh, one prime minister who they all said lasted uh, uh, shorter than a lettuce uh, uh, could, um, uh, shelf life, um, really mm -hmm. proved incompetency. Um, I interviewed two different individuals that uh, in Canada that uh, believe that uh, we have got a real problem with uh, 
implementing change, implementing policies. And one individual who's a former principal secretary to uh, to a prime minister uh, and a premier said that what we need to do is have a chief operating officer of each uh, ministry, uh, at least every major ministry, because uh, the, the deputy ministers are effective uh, in regards, in regards to policy recommendations, but terrible in regards to actual implementation. And what we need is competency. Do we have a need for competency in government? A thousand percent, yes. Government service has become so much less appealing to people both interested in going into politics or interested in going into the civil service in recent years. Pay isn't great on the political side. The abuse is growing all the time. You know, 20 years ago, you didn't have to get the regular death threats that are now part of being every uh, elected politician in Canada from a small town councillor all the way up to the prime minister, that we've got a huge problem with government over-promising and under-delivering. And I served as a cabinet minister in a government where we actually introduced that idea of the chief operating officer at the provincial level. And that ties into a reform that I wasn't able to get through, but I, I really want to talk about federally, is how we need to have government line departments responsible for just managing what's already being decided. And then another group of people who come up with the clever new ideas that might well cross over three or four different departments might see that it would be better not to have two of those three or four departments even continue to exist. Because if we can't justify something based on the results it gives to Canadians, why are we spending taxpayers' money on it? Similarly, there might be some new idea that we've never touched before as a government that would make total sense for a government to be involved with. One of the areas I think we are currently seeing a huge lack of oversight is how we handle our tech companies with the liberals sort of falling back on 19th century taxation ideas to try and uh, stop the big tech companies from taking over our world and protect Canadian media. And that's been a disaster because they're lo not looking at anything new. So I think the idea of competency is critical. I think your point about the UK election is absolutely the case. And it also shows that you know, the Labour Party has lost election after election after election when it was seen as being incompetent and extreme. They ditched the extremism of Mr. Corbyn, replaced Mr. Corbyn with Mr. Starmer, who put in a massive emphasis as the country's former chief prosecutor. So he certainly came to his uh, his sort of medal of competency, honestly. He worked to put together a team of people. He looked at them and go, you know, I can see these people running the country. I can imagine this man in cabinet, this woman serving in a senior position. And the country rewarded them the other week with a massive majority. So it's uh, that's exactly the sort of approach that I want to see my party take, which is candidates who are able to, if they have the honor of being elected, actually hit the ground running, serve as MPs. If we are given the incredible honor of serving in the cabinet, to be able to handle those responsibilities. So something else we're working on behind the scenes is the strictest vetting procedure ever used by any Canadian political party. Not just testing for competence, but also ch checking for any possible hint of foreign connections that could be damaging to Canada's security, something that we've certainly seen discussed a lot in Ottawa the last few months. So things like that, there's lots of opportunities to innovate. It's just the old parties have no incentive to do it. The left wing one yells at the right wing one. They wait a few years, switch position, do the same thing in reverse. It's not working for Canada. As you said, we have a growing competency problem because people don't want to work in a system like that. And if you're an MP, why would you sign up as an accomplished, smart person who hopefully believes they've got something to contribute, to give back to their community, to their country? Why would you stand for office just so you can be a trained SEAL following the orders of your party leader or the prime minister to vote the way they tell you, regardless of your local community, regardless of your platform sometimes? That can also be changed. We're talking about the UK. In the UK, backbench MPs can vote against their party leaders. That's our system. We just had some party leaders 100 or so years ago who just kind of forgot to implement that part of it. There's no change required except for the will, the political will of party leaders to say that if something is in our platform, we expect you to vote for it. Would you, you allow caucus platform, uh, members to sense. vote out their leader? Pardon me? Would you allow caucus members to vote out their leader? Like do, you? Yeah, can I think having, giving caucus members an opportunity to have a say along, I think Michael Chong's reforms uh, have some issues, but the idea that you can give MPs the, the chance on something that wasn't in the platform to vote, not just their conscience, but I flip it around. 
say that the leader's office has a responsibility to build a consensus for each new bill that comes in front of the comments, for each new idea, that you've got to be constantly campaigning as a leader in the leader's office to win the support of your team for your ideas. Again, if they're in the platform, I think you should vote for them because you're all elected on, on under that document. But for anything new that comes along, and Lord knows we've seen lots of things pop up after elections that no, no one expected, whether it's wars, pandemics, or the other uh, assorted horsemen of the apocalypse who are all hanging around in our front yard at the moment. So all those things are all times when leaders should have a team in their caucus of capable, competent people who they can negotiate with to build support for government bills. And that should be how we make decisions, not forcing MPs to vote for their party every single bill without question. Leadership should be earned in a party on an ongoing basis. And for anyone who says this is some pie in the sky idea, you know, who's been doing this, it's pretty big success for several hundred years. The Westminster system as used in the UK, which we literally copied our system from. So there's no reason we can't do this, except for the lack of will from political leaders who kind of like having a caucus. They can just tell what to do all the time. It's a lot easier that way, but it leads to worse outcomes because you miss all that local knowledge and expertise. You miss that competency from your writing level MPs who can say, you know, this might sound good, but it's just not going to work here. I got to so ask you about the greater, economy. Greater legislative democracy works better for democracy. I got to ask you about the economy. Uh, our former uh, minister of finance has written a book saying there's not a prosperity agenda or growth agenda in Canada. There was uh, quite a uh, large uh, article in the Globe Mail uh, about a year ago that said that one of the biggest problems is that historically we've always had a partnership, whether in the Liberal Party or the Conservative Party, between uh, political people and financial people, Bay Street uh, business people. Uh, and they talked about Harper and Flaherty. They talked about Martin and Kretscher. They talked about uh, you know Trudeau and uh, Turner and others. Uh, and that uh, now, both in the Liberals and the Conservatives, uh, we only have career politicians. Uh, we don't have people in cabinet uh, and or sort of, uh, you know, in senior levels in partnership with the prime minister that have got real world business experience. Our uh, gross, uh, uh, our, our, our median uh, uh, disposable income is now supposedly 40 percent of the United States. Our productivity, prosperity has declined fairly dramatically. Uh, real, uh, real incomes haven't raised what are you going to do from the economic standpoint? And do you think you need to really have business people, uh, economically oriented people in your party and in your cabinet? Well, absolutely. You've got to have people from all different walks of life. And that's the point. But more than just having them there, which has been where Mr. Trudeau's approach begins and ends with just the, he wants the photo op, he wants the picture. He wants to be able to say, oh, look, gender balanced cabinet, it's 2015. I don't think Judy Wilson-Raybould or Miss Patty Pot Taylor or now apparently Miss Freeland, who looks like she's about to be added to the list of women thrown under the bus by the prime minister, would necessarily think that his commitment to gender equality, to pick on one example, has shown itself to be anything other than a, a bit of performance art. So what we need is for prime ministers and party leaders to have to listen to their MPs, which gets back to the point I was just making, that until we change the party discipline system, you could have a the most successful people in the world from every single discipline sitting around a caucus table. And if they don't have the right to vote differently, to vote against their leader without being booted out of caucus, then they are unlikely to speak truth to power. That's just the nature of human beings. So first, we got to make some changes in our institution. Easy to make. Those, again, don't even require a single piece of legislation. They require political will on the part of party leaders. And I can promise you that if I ever get the honor of leading my party in the House of Commons, that's what we'll do. Because the consequences of this centralized politics is this growing extremism. And it means that we are abandoning some of the themes that used to be central to federal politics, like making sure our economy works and making sure we are increasingly productive. We have a liberal party that's not even committed to growth. We've got people talking about degrowth on the political left. The idea of somehow we shrink, that that's going to make our life better. It's one of the most fundamentally anti Wasn't that an issue back in the 1970s, issue. the limits to growth? Yeah. Well, except we, sh we showed comprehensively with the massive explosion in wealth in the years and the decades since then. That was utter nonsense. Humans are absolutely capable of fixing our problems if we're given the space and the tools to do it. And that's what I think we're talking about here is fixing the productivity gap. We've got to look at what's causing that start with, it's being caused by excessive levels of regulation that do nothing to protect the health and welfare of workers or to make sure that uh, businesses compete fairly one with the other. In fact, we don't do any of that when it comes to, for example, supply management, where we give 
control over vast sectors of our economy to tiny numbers of players who often have nothing more to commend them than the fact their families have been in whatever line of business they're talking about for decades, whether it's fishing licenses, agricultural uh, protectionism with the supply management systems, our airline and telecom sectors. We need deregulation in this country and not deregulation along a Reaganite line where we just strip away protections for workers, but one where we open up competition because competition is what drives down price and cell increases phones, Cell phones, please open up cell phones. Well, exactly. It's inc it's insane. I always I use this example. 20 years ago, 21 years ago now, I was living in Cambodia. And you know the film Apocalypse Now when they go up the Mekong River up towards Laos. And this is presented as being like the furthest place you can possibly get from civilization on the planet. I was up there 21 years ago and I had a cell phone that I bought for 15 bucks and a SIM card that I paid a buck for. And I had, I don't even know how cheap the actual per minute use cost was, but it was negligible. And that was 21 years ago in the middle of the rainforests in Northern Cambodia. Why on earth are we still in Canada accepting in 2024 that we have these tiny number of well-connected people who get to decide how we access some of the most important tools we use every day? Why do we tolerate? I'm sitting here in Atlantic Canada where I routinely drive to Ontario because I know I'll get there reliably. Whereas if I have to fly Air Canada, I could easily be waiting a day or two days. So far, my record is three days of waiting to get on a flight. And when I get on that flight, I get to think about the fact that I paid more to fly from Fredericton to Toronto than I can get a flight from Toronto to Bangkok and back round trip. That the is competition. not right. It's the competition. But what do we have? Oh, well, our standards are high to protect Canadians. Protect us from what exactly? We Dominic. have standards around the world around some of these issues where we can look and be inspired by what other countries have done, how they succeeded. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel here, but we got to start talking about how the wheels are stuck right now and get them moving again. Dominic Cardi, this is really exciting and, and interesting. If people want to follow your party's progress, uh, get involved, learn what's going on. Is there a website? Is there a Twitter? What what should people do? OurCanadianFuture.com. And uh, I'd be happy to hear from folks. And something I've done my entire time in politics, including when I was a cabinet minister, if people are interested and want to chat, reach out to me directly. If I get elected, I might not be able to continue doing this at a federal level because it's more people than provincially. But you can reach out to me in my phone numbers, 506-238-5550. And you can reach me on my email, which is leader at ourcanadianfuture.com. And uh, our website should be easy to find. Just give me a call, send me a text, drop me an email. Happy to chat. This is about Canadians working with Canadians to make our country better. Dominic Cardi, leader of the Canadian Future Party. Thank you so much for uh, joining us and uh, giving us a sense of uh, some really important policy issues uh, and uh, I think some competency uh, and prosperity issues that are equally, if not more important, frankly, uh, and the excitement of uh, potentially something to fill the center of our political spectrum where I think there's a complete hole right now for people like me that are fiscal conservatives and social progressives. So I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. We're going to take a break, a final break, and come back with some of my own comments in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Thank you, Dominic.